Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Get your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis for my 31st year of preaching on that one book. If you're here this morning, you're going to get blessed. I'm going to be speaking on the subject that's up top there. Please write that in your notes. We are going through what we call the Kingdom Series for the whole year. And we're going to be looking at accelerated progress through kingdom leadership, learning how to live in the kingdom of God. We're going to speak this morning on contrasts in kingdoms. Say that with me. Contrasts in kingdom. One more time. Contrasts in kingdoms. Very important subject this morning. So please take notes. And by the way, it's important for you to take notes so you can become a teacher of the words you learn. All right? What you learn is not just for you, but the Bible says that we must give to those who will in turn share it with other people as well. And all of you in this place will be called on sometime or the other in the future. The Lord's going to call on you to minister to somebody. So you might as well learn to take notes now. Every time we meet, it's Bible school. It's seminary. It's college in this place. And so you sit as a disciple. Disciple means student. You're a student of God's word and, of course, of his work. Contrast in kingdoms. We're going to talk about that this morning. I'm going to use some of our information here on our PowerPoint so you can kind of learn pretty fast. The scripture I want to start off with, uh, just a review, is Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Remain in the book of Genesis, please. In Matthew 24, 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to every nation, and then the end will come. Jesus was very specific about what we are supposed to be preaching. Then in Matthew 4, 17, is his inaugural address. The first public statement made by Jesus was this statement in his ministry. It's found in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Very important verse. This is the first public statement made by Jesus when he began his ministry. He began with this word, repent. Repent means what? To change your mind. It also means to change the way you think or the way you've been conditioned to think. Change your thinking. Then he says, because the kingdom of heaven has arrived. The King James Version says, is at hand. The original Greek written there is, has arrived. So he was saying, repent or change your thinking because a kingdom of God has come to earth, it has arrived. Look at the connection between the two statements. One, he says, change your thinking. Why? Because the kingdom of God is here. In other words, before the kingdom of God came back to earth, he says, your thinking was okay. But now that it's here, you've got to change the way you think. The word repent doesn't just mean to change your thinking, but it means to reverse it completely. In other words, to repent means to turn completely around in the opposite direction in your thinking, which means that to live in the kingdom of God, you've got to think the opposite to the way you've been taught. The kingdom of God takes everything that's been right side up and turns it upside down. So to live in the kingdom of God, you've got to think and act and believe completely opposite to what you've been taught. This is why repent is so important. Because repent is not feeling sorry for what you've done, Repent means to change your mind. Why? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is the man. So if your thinking doesn't change, the man doesn't change. So Christ says to live in this kingdom, you've got to change your thinking, which will change your life, will change your mind. I think his first statement implies that the kingdom of God is a contrasting kingdom to the one you were born in and lived in all your life. You've got to think differently to survive in the kingdom of God. Let's take a look at some of the thoughts concerning this kingdom. Number one, God's original plan was to extend his heavenly kingdom on earth through mankind. That's God's original purpose and still is. 
Number two, God's purpose was to establish a family of sons and not servants. And number three, God's purpose was to establish a kingdom of sons and not subjects. God didn't want to rule over slaves. He wanted to have a family that shared his rulership. And that's a different concept of kingdoms. And then number four, God's purpose originally was to establish a commonwealth of citizens and not Christians. I want to contrast these two terms because Christians are religious people, but citizens are legal people. God did not want religious people. He wanted to have legal people, people who have a legal right to be a part of his family. So you will find Jesus distinguishing these two all through his teachings. In the book of John chapter 8 in my mind, I see it now going through my spirit. In 8, chapter 8, Jesus said that famous verse that you all know about. It says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, the verse just before that says that the servant is not a part of the house, but the son belongs to the house. Very important declaration he makes. In other words, if you are a, a, a servant of the Lord, that means you are not really a part of the house. You're just kind of doing things in the house. But he says the son is in the house. He's a part of the house. He's a part of the family. God wanted to establish a citizenry and not a religious movement. And finally, God's original plan was his desire to have relationship and not religion. Religion means to search. Relationship means you found him. Once you become a believer in Christ and receive his Holy Spirit, you are no longer a religious person. Religious people are looking for the Father God. Those who have found him have returned home and they are sons. This is expressed clearly by Jesus in the story of the, of the prodigal son, which again is an important story because it begins with the spirit of a son who left home, became a servant to the slavery spirit out there, and then came back and his desire was not to become a son but to come to become a servant. Jesus tells a story that the father ignored that and said, my son is home. So God doesn't want servants nor slaves. He wants sons. He wants relationship. Here's where it all begins, the kingdom attitude. The kingdom concept begins in the mind of God. In the book of Genesis 1.26, God creates the human being and he tells us why. It says in the book of Genesis 1.26, and God said, let us create man in our own image and in our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the cattle of the field, and over all the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the ground, end quote. This verse is the key to kingdom thinking. The word dominion, if you check in my notes there, is in capital letters, why? Because the, the center of the sentence is the word dominion. God expresses his desire for you, and for every one of the six billion people on earth right now, and that is for you to have dominion over the earth. God did not create you to attend church services or to have prayer meetings or to even have worship songs. God's intent was for you to have dominion over this planet. It's clear in his original mandate. I want to call this the dominion mandate. Write that down, please. The dominion mandate. That's what this particular verse is all about. God's mandate to man is to dominate the earth. That's God's intent and it never changes. The intent is another word for purpose, which means God's purpose is for mankind to dominate the earth, and that's it. It never says to dominate heaven. God says to dominate the earth. Dominion is important here then. Let's find out a little bit more about what the dominion spirit is. The program of God then is simple. One, to rule the visible world from the invisible world through the invisible spirit living in the visible body on the visible earth. That's God's program. In other words, God wants to rule the seen world from the unseen world where he is by living in the unseen spirit of man in the seen body that is on the seen earth. God's program then was to rule the invisible from the invisible through the invisible living in the visible on the visible. Is that indivisible? <laughs> Put it another way. God's program was to have his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven through his children, which is a family of sons 
an offspring. That's God's program. Very simple, very straightforward. God, therefore, wanted you to have what I call the dominion leadership mandate. Write these terms down, please. Here's what the Hebrew word dominion means. Dominion means, number one, to govern. Secondly, to control. Thirdly, to rule. Fourthly, to manage. Fifth, to master something. And sixth, to lead. All of these are important to you because that is what God intended you to do. God intended and originally desired for you to, to actually become a governor. Let's go back and put those words in the sentence God wrote about you. It says in Genesis 1.26, And God said, Let us what? Make man in our own image and in our likeness, and let them what? Govern, rule, lead, master, control, and subdue the earth. In other words, every human being on this planet was created to do that list. Let me say one thing here, very important, very important. Whatever God creates something to do, he designs it for. I've said this for the last 25 years and people still miss it. Whatever God creates something to do, he designs it with. In other words, when God creates the bird to fly, he puts flight ability in the bird. When God creates the fish to swim, he put the ability to swim in the fish. If God creates you to dominate, he put the spirit of controlling, governing, rulership, leadership, and management in you. That's why every human being naturally resists oppression. Because we are designed to rule, not to be ruled. We are designed to govern and not to be governed. We are designed to manage things and not to be managed. We are designed to lead and not to follow. Now, you may not want to admit this, but that is your experience every day. That is why you hate to be told what to do, am I right? Don't you hate when people tell you, even your spouse. Cook me some food, wait a minute. Or the office boss says, type the letter and do it now. And all of a sudden, something goes off quietly on the inside. Even though you're typing, you're thinking crazy. You're, you know, you're typing it, but there's the spirit. Even as a child, your mom says, sit down. And you say, no. And you say, sit down. And she, you say, no. Your mom says, I'll whoop you. You say, mm, no. And you still say no while you're sitting down. Why? Deep in your spirit, there is the spirit of what? Government, rulership, control, management, and leadership and mastering. You are designed for that. That's why the Holy Spirit himself will not violate God's original spirit he put in you. The Holy Spirit does not really control your life. He convicts you, he will guide you, he will lead you, but never drag you. Can I hear an amen? amen. He himself will not violate the spirit he put inside of you because he give you whatever he designed you to do. So leadership is not something you really have to 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 to, to to study is something you got to discover already on the inside. Everybody in this place was born to lead. You were designed to master. You were equipped to control. And you have the spirit of leadership. This is why every person that God has called through the Bible's history and story, he always addresses them based on what he knows about them. He told Abraham, you are a father of great nation. He told Sarah, you are a mother of nation. He told that, that old coward uh, Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor. He told David, you are a king when he was a kid. He told Joseph, you are a ruler while he was a slave. God always speaks to the real you, not what people say about you. Amen. Tell your neighbor if you knew who I really was, you'd be glad to sit next to me right now. Clap your hands and thank God. You are a leader. It's birth on the inside. <laughs> on your job, when you go to work in the morning, stop walking around like as if you are an employee. You are a, a deployee. <laughs> in other words, you were not born to be employed. You were born to be deployed, to release your leadership ability. A job is God's opportunity for you to release your leadership in, and they should be privileged to have you work in there with your anointed gifts. They can't pay you enough, so don't complain about the salary, because you work more than what they could ever pay you. Clap your hands, somebody. So work is not about salary. It's about deployment. Because your leadership cannot be bought nor paid for. Can I hear an amen? 
That's why you feel good when people give you a, a, a title. Why? Because they're getting close to the real you. When you get promoted, you feel good. Why? You feel good not because of the money. You feel good because all of a sudden, your spirit of leadership begins to rise a little higher. That's why God calls you sons of God. But you ain't there yet in your mind, you see. You are sons of God. You're not just Christians. You are sons of God. That means you are royal blood. You are a child of a king. That means you are a prince and a princess. But you ain't there yet. Because your mentality ain't there yet. You're still acting like the prodigal son. You want to be a servant. I'm come to tell you here that God wants you to lead and to master and to govern and to control. And that's why my attitude is the way it is. I have been convicted about this in my own life. That's why you don't have to wonder about me. I believe I am all of that. <laughs> my job is to get you to believe you are all of that. Tell your neighbor, I'm all of that. Come on, sit up and wide here and say, I'm all of that. Come on, praise his name, somebody. I am all of that list. That's what God says he created me to be. Can I hear an amen? So when the fish see me, they're supposed to get nervous. Look at that list. When the birds be supposed to bow and say, yes, chief. That ain't funny. Trees that grow in the field are supposed to respect me. Why? I am their master. I control them. I am their governor. This is why we should never oppress people, control people, depress people, oppress people, suppress people. We are attempting to do something that God wouldn't even do himself. Let's talk about what this kingdom is all about then. God wanted you to be kings over the dome of earth. Dome means dominion. Dominion, which means domain. You can only dominate a domain. That's why God specified your domain. Let them have what? Dominion over the earth. So you are the dominator and your territory or your domain is earth. So your domain for dominating is earth. So you are a ruler. Everybody say ruler. The word ruler is the same word for king. And the word dominion means to rule. So you are the king of the domain. So you are the king of this domain of earth. So you are the kingdom of God on earth. The kingdom of God, therefore, is not earth. The kingdom is the functioning of the rulers on the domain. That's the kingdom. So the kingdom is not the physical planet. The kingdom is you carrying out the dominion of God on this planet. It's you who are the kingdom. You are the king, ruler, dom, domain. You are the kingdom. You are the kingdom. You are God's kingdom on earth. Which means that every one of us are kings over the domain of earth, and that's God's property. So the word domain means territory. Territory. It's important to remember that territory is, is necessary to be a king. God gave you a territory. What was the territory? It's found in the book of Psalm 115. We read it last time, verse 14 and 15 and 16. It says, he who created the heavens and the, world and the whole earth is the God of heaven. Verse 15 says, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he gave to man. Psalm 115, verse 15 and 16. Powerful verse. The heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he gave to man. Heaven is God's territory. Earth is whose territory? Your territory. That means your domain is earth. Hey, boys, I was born to dominate earth. Say it loud. Let your lungs get some ex excitement. Say it. I was born to dominate earth, not heaven. That's why going to heaven is always a temporary excursion for a human spirit. Because that's not your territory. Your territorial domain is earth. That's why you're coming back here. Even if God got to create a new one. And he will. Kingdom is a domain under which the influence of the king gets its impact. In other words, a kingdom is the domain that is influenced by the king. That's all kingdom means. Now... God's goal is the kingdom of God on earth. Some of you read the Bible many times. You've read the New Testament and it four God. You got confused, right? Because you keep saying sometimes Jesus would say the kingdom of heaven. Other times he would say the kingdom of God. Then he would say the kingdom of heaven. Then he would interchange. He said the kingdom of God. Now whenever you use the kingdom of God, he's referring to headquarters. Get it? He's referring to the actual impact and influence of God himself. 
When he talks about the kingdom of heaven, he's referring to its impact on earth. So he's talking about transfer of power. That's why he kept on saying the kingdom of God is like, and then he would explain these things called parables. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven are basically the same, except one of them is referring to the actual rulership of God. The other is referring to the transfer of that rulership to a territory. So the kingdom of God is God's rulership within the heart of a spirit of man. And the kingdom of heaven is when that impacts the man's environment. In other words, we can take the kingdom of heaven to our work every morning and influence that whole place with the kingdom of God by us taking the kingdom of heaven in us to that place. And that's why Jesus said the kingdom of heaven has come to us. It has arrived. The fall of mankind was a problem. In the, it, in the instatement of a new counterfeit kingdom called the kingdom of darkness, very important statement in the Bible, it calls this kingdom that man fell into the kingdom of darkness. Everybody's the kingdom of darkness. Write the word darkness down. What does darkness mean? It means ignorance. Hebrew word there for ignorance. The Hebrew word is very important. The Greek word is also the same word as absence of knowledge. In other words, the kingdom of darkness is a domain in which a king rules by ignorance. Interesting. So who is the king of the kingdom of darkness? Obviously Satan. The Bible says that the satanic ruler of this world has blinded the minds of those Least they see the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's First Corinthians chapter 5. Once again it says what? The God of this world has what? Blinded the minds. What's your mind? That's your source of knowledge. He blinds your minds. It never says he blinds your eyes. The ruler of this world blinds the minds of those. Least they see the glorious gospel of the kingdom of God. So we got two kingdoms going on here. We got a ruler who rules by ignorance. We call it darkness. And we got a kingdom that rules by knowledge, which is light. And that is why Satan's greatest power is what you don't know. What you don't know is where he gets his strength from. The first thing, ready for this, that Satan attacked in the Garden of Eden was Eve's and Adam's knowledge. Want to hear it? The first thing God gave Adam to protect him was what? Information. He says, if you don't touch that tree and you obey my commandments, you shall live. The day you eat from that tree, disobey my commandment, you will die. So what do they have? Information. They had knowledge. In chapter 3 of Genesis, Satan shows up. His first statement was, did God say? What is he talking about? Did you get information? Did God say, if you eat from this tree, you will surely die? And Eve responds, God did say. We did get information about the tree. Then Satan decides to attack the knowledge they had. He said, but God knows. Where did he get that from? He says, God told you that because God knows that if you eat from that tree, you won't surely die. You will become like him. They already were like him. His first attack was to doubt the knowledge you have. Is that deep? Very important. Satan's greatest attack against you is to doubt the knowledge you got from God. God says, you are healed by his stripe. Satan says, but you still feel the pain. He, now, now you got two different informations going on here. God says you've been healed by his stripes 2,000 years ago. Satan said, but you feel the pain. Two informations coming into your bank of knowledge now. So now you got a decision to make whether to believe one information or the other information. And if you believe the pain part, then you are in the dark concerning the healed part. And this is why the kingdoms work against each other. The kingdom of darkness is to destroy you. The kingdom of light is to give you life. That's why you should walk in the light as he is in the light. What is light? Knowledge. The kingdom of darkness, therefore, gets its power from what you don't know. 
This is why I encourage you, everyone here, to keep reading, to keep studying, to attend every opportunity to learn. Every time I open the doors of this sanctuary and stand up here to speak, and every one of us began to open the word and preach to you. If I was you, I would attend every meeting. Do you know that I attend every meeting I get a chance to here? Myself? Even if, I, even if I'm not speaking, I want to be here. Why? Because the word of God constantly changes your darkness into light. Some of you miss great opportunities to come on Sunday nights because you don't see the importance of it, so you decide to stay home, maybe do some other things, relax, whatever. But you see, if you understand the word of God and what it is, Satan hates the word of God. So he loves to lullaby you to a good rest on Sunday night. He gives you 10 different excuses why you can't come to get the word. On Friday nights, Satan got all the thing all worked out. Why? No matter what you learn, if it's not the word of God, it doesn't destroy darkness. Thy word is light. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every what? Word that comes from the mouth of God. It says, and Satan came immediately to steal the word. Now remember Jesus made that statement concerning what? He says, uh, the power of the sower. The kingdom of God is like a man who goes into a field and he sows the seed out in the field. And the Bible says what? Some fall on stony ground, some fall on thin soil, some are choked by weeds, and some grow and become fruitful. Then he says, he says, but the birds came immediately and picked up the seed. As soon as he sows the seed, the birds came immediately, he says, and they picked up the seed. Then they asked him, Master, explain the parable to us. His first answer was, the sower sows the seed, and the bird is the evil one. Got the point? He said, before the seed even gets set in the soil, the evil one goes after the word. Please notice, he doesn't go after you. He comes immediately to steal the word. Why? Satan ain't afraid of you. If he's the ruler over darkness, then you ain't his fear. What's his fear? Light. <laughs> if his kingdom is darkness, his nightmare is light. And you are not light. You possess light when you possess the word. The entrance of your word bringeth light. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light. In other words, it's the word you need to keep getting, not fat on food. Satan is afraid of the word. He comes immediately to steal the word. So we got the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. We got the kingdom of revelation knowledge and the kingdom of ignorance. That's what we are fighting in. The Bible says you were born children of darkness. In other words, you were born stupid. Sorry. You were born ignorant. <laughs> Until you meet God and start to learn his word, you are in darkness. That means if you went to college and got a PhD but don't know Jesus, you got a lot of dark information. You all hear me? You can have a PhD, DDD, five PhDs, but if you don't know God, you are educated in darkness. You are highly darkly educated. <laughs> the Pharisees had that problem. They were doctors of the law, the Bible says. They had doctor's degrees in the laws of their own learning. And the Bible says they were ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. In other words, it's popular to go to school. Some folks never graduate. You notice that? Some people got deep education. I mean, you run into a doctor who got a PhD in physiological studies in the body of man, and then he smokes cigarettes. That's always, that's always amazes me. A dentist eating candy. I mean, that amazes me. It amazes me. You can be totally educated in darkness and never see the light. That is why Jesus said to Nicodemus, who came at night, he was a doctor in the law of his day. She said, Nicodemus, you still must be born all over again because what you learn ain't no good. You know, it's kind of depressing for God to tell you you are a completely educated fool. That's what he's really saying about the kingdom of, 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 of darkness. Darkness is 
is, is absence of the information from God. Look at Romans 12 too, very important statement. It says, and Paul is speaking to believers. That's important to begin with. The book of Romans was written to the church at Rome. It's a powerful church that was raised up there. And Paul really loved this church. And Paul wrote them this note, this letter. And the letter is really about their redemptive uh, access to God. And in chapter 12, verse 1, it starts this way. I beseech ye, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, well-pleasing unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and be no longer conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Everybody say repent. Amen. Say it again. Amen. Who is he writing to? He is writing to Christians. That means believers, sons of God, who already had the Holy Spirit. But he says, you have not been changed. What's he talking about? He says, look, you can be saved, but not converted. Salvation takes place instantly. Conversion can take a lifetime. It's like moving from an old dilapidated house to a palace in one day. My God. All your bad habits come with you. Hello. You know, I heard a story, and this is a true story they say, here in the Bahamas, where a family moved from one of our islands years ago. It's old, I'm not talking about your family. Uh, they moved from the islands, and they came to the capital island here in, the, in Nassau, and the story, when I heard the story, I said, now that is a graphic example of how the kingdom works. They came here, and all their life they used an outhouse toilet. An outhouse. So they came here, and they moved into a beautiful new home. That was an, it was an inheritance that it was left to them. And all their life they used an outhouse. When they came here, the story goes that they didn't know how to operate the new house. And when they used the toilet, they stood up on top of the toilet bowl and stooped down. You get a picture of this. It's graphic, isn't it? And they did that for months until somebody was visiting. <laughs> and the family that was visiting them was wondering, I, I saw your son, a little boy, in the toilet. A little kid. And they said, what is he doing? They said, why? What's the problem? And the, 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 the family member says, the, the kid is standing up on the bowl, stooping down on top of the toilet bowl. They said, so what? <laughs> That's how we live in the kingdom. We live in the kingdom of God, but bring our old habits, our old mindset. So Paul is saying, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transform is the, Hebrew, is the Greek word metamorphy. That means metamorphosis, which means to be a complete change. He's telling us that we haven't changed yet. To live in this kingdom, you need a complete revolution of mental state. You need to change the way you think. He says, by the way, the, the, the next verse is important. I'm not going to quote it up here, but it says, and then you will know what is God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. That's a powerful statement. He says, look, in order to capture God's perfect will for your life, you got to change your thinking. Now, I think Paul wrote these three words because I think they're different levels. God's good will is God's good will. You know, someone give you good will. Good will simply means that they tolerate you. You know, they, they kind of put up with you. Acceptable means that could pass. And I think a lot of times God says, okay, I know you're in there, but that could pass. But the third one is God's perfect will. You are now exactly what God wanted. And the only way to get there, Paul says, is to have your mind transformed. Have your life transformed by what? Renewing the way you think. So the thinking brings the transformation. The two kingdoms, therefore, are completely opposite to each other. Jesus, therefore, came to introduce this kingdom, and that's why there was such a conflict with him. Let's talk about briefly how he introduced the kingdom. Number one, he came to reintroduce the kingdom of God to man on earth. Matthew 4, 17. Very simple. Repent, for the kingdom of God has arrived. He also came to restore the righteousness and holiness of mankind. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, 
it says, for we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. It says, for we have been made righteous by him. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I write that word righteousness down, please. Jesus came to make us righteous again. The word righteous doesn't mean to wear a long dress, a long hat, an ugly face, and a white Bible, white shoes, and all them other things. It doesn't mean not to put on lipstick and don't wear no hair rings, all that stuff. That's not righteousness. The word righteous is a legal word, not a religious word. And the word righteous means to position oneself. It means right positioning. Jesus came to make us righteous again, which means he came to put us back in the position where we are in right relationship with God again so that we can be qualified to receive the promises of God. This is very important to kingdom thinking. You see, when you live in a kingdom, uh, you're talking about a kingdom, a governing rulership, and you are the domain. So the kingdom of God is God's rulership over your life, which is his domain. And then when you rule the earth, that's the kingdom of heaven having its impact through your life on the physical planet. Think about this. <laughs> when Adam sinned, the Bible calls him unrighteous. In other words, Adam went out of position with the government and therefore all the rights that he had as a citizen were canceled. Uh, there may be some of you here who were in prison some time ago or maybe you have a family member who's in prison or know somebody who may be imprisoned. Do you notice something? Whenever a government has a citizen that breaks the law and they are incarcerated, what's the first thing they ask for? What do they ask for first? Your passport. Why? Can't travel no more. Now, what is your passport? Your passport is your highest component of citizenship. Without a passport, you are not a citizen anymore. I want you to think about this. Now, why does the government grab your passport as soon as you are considered improper in their kingdom? Because they make you an uncitizen. I didn't say non-citizen, because you're still in the country. But you are an uncitizen. Everybody say un. un. Say un is not none. Un is not none. This is very important. You are still a citizen because you're in the country, but now you are under the complete judgment of the government. So the government takes away all of your rights. You become out of position with the government. Now, the government has what? A lot of promises they give to us, don't they? If you are a citizen, you got the right to own property, to buy food, to drive on the streets. You got, you got the right to protect property. You got the right to vote. You got the right to do all these things as a citizen. If you are in prison, you can't vote. Did you know that? If you are in prison, you can't drive where you feel like. You can't eat what you want to. You can't sleep when you want to. You can't go to bed when you want to. When you are in prison, they literally take over your life. You are under the control of what? Judgment. That's what happened to Adam when he disobeyed the government of God. God took back his passport and Adam became a prisoner of darkness. Therefore, he became ruled by a warden called Satan. Get the picture? Heaven took his passport back and the warden Satan took over his life and Adam became what? The Bible says we are slaves to sin. We are in prison. What Jesus say in Luke chapter 4, verse 18? He says, I have come to set what? The prisoners free. Why? You are in prison when you're born here in this earth. You are unrighteous. Unrighteous means that you are still God's image, but you have no rights. That's important. 
Jesus came to restore your positioning so you can claim your citizen promises. Hallelujah. Ah. God set up a, sep a, a temporary government in the Old Testament. It's called the covenant. The covenant became God's temporary government. God gave that covenant to Abraham. Matter of fact, uh, he established that covenant through Noah first. And you know Noah's great great grandson was Abraham. And God said, Abraham, here's how I'm going to rule. I'm going to give you a covenant. If you keep my covenant, then that'll make you what? Righteous. What is righteous? Getting back in position with God. That's why it's so important to read the Old Testament. Don't miss tonight. Because you see, Abraham believed God's word and the Bible says that was made unto him righteousness, which means what? It didn't mean Abraham changed his robes and wore turbans and wore a cross around his neck. It meant that Abraham was now back in relationship with the government of God, so now he could claim things that were in the covenant. Praise God. You all must say, listen to me. Abraham, therefore, became a qualified citizen again. Paul talks about Abraham a lot. Do you know why? Because after Abraham came who? Moses. And by the time Moses showed up, these people knew nothing about God. They were in Pharaoh's prison for 400 years, which means that they didn't even know God. That's why Moses had to go to them back to Egypt and had to tell them, introduce them to God. The people asked him, who's this God? Not just Pharaoh, the Israelites didn't know God. That's right. So God said, look, I got a big problem. Not only don't they know the covenant of Abraham, but they don't even know the God of the covenant. So he gave Abraham what? A list of laws called what? The Ten Commandments. And God says the first thing to tell them is don't worship no other God. He's trying to change their minds. Change their minds. Now, this is important here because you see, Moses ended up with a list of laws. Don't, don't, don't. Abraham had no laws. He just had a promise and he believed it and he became what? Righteous. He became in line with God again. Now God says, for, for me to get them where Abraham was, I got to even get them to believe in me first. Mm -hmm. See the difference? Now what happened was the last government element of God was the Ten Commandments. And so <laughs> when Jesus came, Christ didn't come to really talk about the Ten Commandments. He really came to talk about what Abraham got. Are you with me? So, when Paul writes, Paul says, uh, when God promised Abraham, he was not speaking to Abraham, but he was speaking to his seed, which was Christ, that he would come to make us righteous. Jesus came to line you back up with the government of God so you can claim your rights. In the United States, just recently, I'm afraid to talk about it because it's a big argument right now, but in the United States recently, <laughs> the president, the former president, Bill Clinton, took a presidential prerogative. You all been hearing this on the news a lot, right? His prerogative is that he could pardon a certain amount of people as the president before he leaves office. He decided to pardon some people. Now, pardon is a dangerous thing. Because no matter what you've done, if the king or the ruler pardons you, you pardon. Now, the people who he pardoned, some of them were in jail. Others were fugitives on the run. The reason why there's so much argument about a few of these people is because the crimes that they are guilty of, people are saying, ain't no way we can let them go. But then the law says, constitutionally, if they are pardoned, it's as if they have done nothing. They get their passport back. They can travel where they want to. They can work where they want to. They can do business. They can buy and sell. They have no limitations. Like they never did anything. Do you know what Jesus did on the cross for you? Some of your backgrounds are so terrible. If folks find out about you, they won't sit with you no more. But there's a king who sat on a throne one day with blood dripping down his face and he said, pardon. Tell your
your neighbor, I am right with the government again. Full rights. You know, remember the covenant of Abraham, eh? Jesus did not use, oh Lord help me here, the covenant of Moses. Because that was an educational covenant. He used the covenant of what? Abraham. That's the covenant of faith. There was a woman sitting in a building just like this, in a meeting just like this one day. She was sitting in the center somewhere, according to the word of God, and she was humped over. He was teaching and she was humped over. She couldn't even look up. She was humped over because she had a back problem. Jesus was standing up, speaking, and the Bible says he fastened her eyes on the, because she couldn't see him. You know, when he talks, he wants to see your face. He's God. So she's humped over, and Jesus looks at this woman. And the Bible says, obviously he stared in such a way that everybody knew he going to do something. It says the Pharisees, the big bishops who sitting on the front row, all of them got nervous. And they start sip sipping. And they said, oh dear, it's a Sabbath day. What's he going to do now? He going to do something. He, you know, he ain't supposed to work on the Sabbath. The Bible says Jesus heard them. Yes, Don't let God hear you because he'll do exactly the opposite of what you're sip sipping about. <laughs> it says he heard them and before he addressed the woman, he took care of a righteousness problem. Well, yeah. You missed it. He said, look, I'm not here to talk religion, he says. I am here to talk government, citizenship, legal stuff. Now let's talk, he says. He says, this woman, first of all, isn't she a daughter of Abraham? Now, ladies and gentlemen, Abraham was alive thousands of years before this event. Come on, somebody. He said, but let me tell you some people, this woman's citizenship is in order. Y'all better sit up straight. There's some stuff you're supposed to get this week, not because you are a Bahamian. Thank you, sister. See, the Bahamian a society may have locked some doors on you. They may decide there's certain places you can't go. You can't go up the ladder. You can't go out and start a business. You can't. That, that's all right. That's their kingdom. But you're operating under a different government. This woman was under a government of the Pharisees and scribes who said, keep your disease until you die. But here comes the king, walking in the service one day. And the king said, let me tell you something. That woman, she has a passport, and it doesn't say Pharisee. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. He said, that woman's passport says, kingdom of God, Abraham's daughter. And then he says, if she be a daughter of Abraham, which you all agree with, then ought not. Woo. Let me get out of here. I know you got to go home. He said, ought not. Tell your neighbor, ought not I be blessed. Say, ought not I have be, I be healed right now. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Say, ought not. All my diseases go away. Ought not. Every bill is canceled and paid. Ought not. My business prosper. Ought not I be promoted from heaven? Go ahead and praise the Lord for a second. Clap your hands. Glorify God. Ought not this woman be healed? And the Bible says they were quiet. And he said to the woman, stand up. Hey, boy, tell your, say, tell your neighbor, stand up. Go ahead and do what they say now. Stand up. We're going to get this anointing on us too. We're going to get that same blessing the woman got. The Bible says all of those who are sons of Abraham are also in Christ Jesus. And therefore the promises of Abraham are also the promises of the sons of God. Tell your neighbor I'm in the covenant. Lord, hallelujah. I feel anointing coming on me. Somebody going to get blessed today. Woo! Hallelujah. Pick your Bible up, please. We're going to close with a scripture. Turn to Galatians chapter 3, please. Tell your neighbor, I'm in the kingdom. My passport is in order. And I'm going to the government right now. I'm going to get my promises. Galatians chapter 3, 
Oh my God, this thing is heavy. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Watch this. Everybody got it? Read it out loud. Out loud. I want the devil to hear you read your citizens' rights. It says in verse 26, together, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed yourselves with Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and is according. Shout somebody. Come on, praise his name. Lift your hands and praise the Lord out loud, everybody. Just go ahead and shout the citizen try. You are qualified to be citizens of the kingdom of God. God's total will. I want you to hold hands with your neighbor right now and tell your neighbor, if you knew who I was going to become, you'd be glad to touch my hands. Hold oh, somebody disagree. Now, in our kingdom, in our kingdom, keep holding hands, in our kingdom, our king says, wherever any two shall touch. And agree concerning anything in the Constitution. It shall be done, Brother Pat. Let me tell you something. If you are not born again by the Spirit today, your passport got the wrong stamp in it. If you came to this meeting today and you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you by faith in Jesus, you are an illegal immigrant. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. That means, you know, illegal immigrant got to sneak around, hide. <laughs> they have no rights to, to anything in the country. If you're here today, don't know Christ as your Savior, you got the wrong passport. But please notice I didn't say that you are non-righteous. You are simply unrighteous. Un means that you're supposed to be. You got a right to be. It's just that you ain't lined up yet. That's why Christ has come. He came to bring us righteousness. And he does it by what? Restoring the Holy Spirit back to man. His word there in the book of Luke 11, he says, it is my father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Why? The Holy Spirit reconnects us to the government. Religion doesn't do that. And that is why it's important for you to receive the Holy Spirit. Not just go to these religious meetings and read books and sing hymns. You got to receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit reconnects you to the government. See, the Bible says the kingdom of God is love, joy, peace. Where? In the Holy Spirit. He reconnects you to the government. He puts you back in line with the government. Then you can claim your rights. I want you to leave this place today. In going into this week, I don't want you to think about fumbling with your rights as a kingdom of God citizen. I want you to understand the rights you have. I told a, 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 a someone last week, when I was in Tampa, Florida, I was telling this, com this uh, conference I was speaking at, I said, do you know that you have a right to go to see the president anytime? They were in shock. I said, in a democracy, the citizens have access to see the prime minister or the president anytime. In our country, you could demand to see the prime minister. Now, whether he will see you is a different problem. No, this ain't, this ain't funny. Constitutionally, he cannot say he don't want to see you. Now, don't all go rush up there tomorrow. But I'm telling you, legally, as a citizen, you have a right to demand to see the highest executive in this country. And legally, you can take him to court if he doesn't want to see you. The kingdom of God is the same way. Once you qualify, as a citizen, then the Bible says, come boldly. Don't stop to see Mary. 
Don't pay no dues to St. Francis of Assisi. Y'all talk to me before I go home. He said, look, you could come. But don't come crawling saying, Lord, if you will, let, me, let your grace squeeze me through. Lord, if you got a little space, let me. Shut up. He says, just burst down the door. Come in. Why? You are a citizen, a blood-bought citizen. Oh, I love to be audacious when I know I'm right. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Some of y'all ain't been praying right the last four or five years. You come in there, Lord, please. Lord, please. I want you to get the kingdom mindset. You go and say, Holy Lord, King of the kingdom, based on the Constitution, no weapon form it can be supposed to prosper, and this one look like it's prospering. Will you please take care of that for me? Come boldly. Okay, Lord, that's enough of this headache. According to my rights in the kingdom, None of these diseases shall come upon me. That was upon Pharaoh, and this was upon Pharaoh. Will you please handle this? And the health department comes. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. Don't ever miss a session in this series. Because if you get this right, you're going to take over where you work in. All the things you've been under, you're going to be on top of them. He has overcome the world, therefore you, he says, will also overcome the world if you walk in his kingdom. You can find that today. Let's pray. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.